How could somebody dispose of a person that easily and get away with it? And now, to find this many years later, another person in his life mysteriously dies. Was she attempting to leave him? Friends of Tammy Niver feel certain she was murdered. Her borrowed car was found abandoned on a busy Ypsilanti roadway in August 1993. The keys were still in the ignition. Her body has never been found. For 25 years, it seemed her case was cold. That is until February 2018, when another woman, Martha Agnew, turned up dead. This is Michigan Crime Stories. Michigan Crime Stories is a podcast that explores murder, mysteries, and mayhem in the Mitten State. Criminal behavior has always enthralled us. It's when societies determine what is and isn't allowed. We assume heinous crimes are committed by monsters, individuals we dehumanize in an effort to make sense of their deeds. Their victims sometimes seem distant, just faded names in a passing headline. But the terrifying truth is that crimes are committed by ordinary people just like you and me. And many of those crimes happen right in our own backyard. My name is Darcy Moran. And this is John Counts. We're reporters for MLive.com and your hosts for Michigan Crime Stories. This episode is one of a multi-part special on MLive's investigation into the disappearance of Tammy Niver and the death of Martha Agnew, as told by host and reporter on this story, Darcy Moran. This episode is titled, Decades Gone. I was in the newsroom at the Ypsilanti Press, which was on Michigan Ave back in the old days, and initially it came in as a press release um, from the sheriff's office. So I remember, you know, calling uh, my contact over there and and getting a few more details, and and again, um, I think we all knew that there was something a little unusual about this. And so I think we we did an initial story that day saying that police were looking um, for this young mother and and that they were seeking help. And, and then it kind of grew, it kind of blossomed from there. That's Sarah Scott. She's currently the regional editor for MLive Southeast Region. But in 1993, she was just a young reporter at the Ypsilanti Press. That's when she first heard the name Tammy Niver. The 24-year-old mother of two was missing. Niver was raised in the affluent city of Ann Arbor, home to the University of Michigan Wolverines. She attended a prominent Ann Arbor High School before getting a GED and enrolling in accounting and computer courses at the community college. She moved a few miles east to the working class neighborhoods of Ypsilanti and Ypsilanti Township. Friends Paula Starnowski and Stacy Burke said she was fun loving and liked to party in her younger days, but was a dedicated, responsible parent. She was intelligent and kind. She also had brown hair and a dazzling smile. She lit up a room, you know, her, like I said, her eyes, her smile. She she had the brightest blue eyes. You know, she'd walk into a room and it, you know, a little loud when she walked in and... She got everybody's attention. Yeah. What would she say? What's up? Let's let's start the party. Yeah, and and it's um, a lot of party days, a lot of hanging out and getting together. It's like I could see her if she was here, she'd pull her and peek behind the tree. Or right. Peek up in the little opening just with the, and you'd see right. that big, cheerful smile. She's kind of silly at that. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, oh, yeah. She loved to make people laugh. She loved. She loved life. She did. She'd been working at an Ypsilanti area dry cleaners for a few months. The night before she went missing, August 6, 1993, she had a shift. It was late when she headed back to the Superior Township home where she was staying. About 12.30 a.m. August 7th, clad in a fashionably matching outfit, a red and white knit sweater, white pants, red socks, and white loafers, she headed to pick up some belongings from her ex-boyfriend. About 11.30 a.m. that same day, the car she'd been driving was found. The white-topped, powder-blue 1979 Mercury Marquis 
was said to have been borrowed from a friend. It was halfway between the Superior Township home where she'd been staying and her ex-boyfriend's Ypsilanti Township apartment. The car was abandoned in the middle of a busy Ypsilanti street bordering Eastern Michigan University's campus. The keys were still in the ignition. A few of her belongings were inside, too. Then, Niver failed to show up for work. She was missing. It was very unsettling. And, um, you know, anybody who's been around this area for a long time knows, of course, the the story of, of, you know, the Michigan murders, um, John Norman Collins. And, you know, so I think anytime something like that happens when a young woman goes missing or a young woman dies under very mysterious circumstances, there is always that sort of worry that the, there might be a serial killer. Uh, people were afraid. Um, it was it was definitely a, a tough time um, for Ypsilanti. And I think especially given that history where we, you know, we did have all those women who were killed and went missing. So it, it was it was tough. And, you know, Ypsilanti is a small town. It's it's a very you know, close-knit, um, blue-collar, co- working-class town. They really care about, they really care about their own. And Tammy Niver was one of their own. Friends and family desperately searched the area for Tammy Niver. Detectives waded through the murky waters of the Huron River, and police dogs searched the woods bordering Eastern Michigan University. A helicopter looked overhead, officials searched the storm drains below, and a psychic even came out to help. Still, there were no signs of Tammy Niver, and fears grew. As a diabetic, she required three shots of insulin a day. She wouldn't have had enough. Well, I mean, I, th- I think there was some thought that, you know, perhaps she just took off, um, that she was with friends, that she was just off, you know, having some fun. I think some people thought maybe she was kidnapped, um, but that she would ultimately be found. Um, but then, you know, th- as, as days turned into weeks, turned to, into months, um, it became, you know, pretty clear that we were no longer really looking for Tammy Niver. We were looking for a body. Here's what friends Stacy Burke and Paula Sarnofsky had to say. She would not have, her children. She no. wouldn't have left those kids like that. And not her family, her mother, who had been ill on and off, her sister. They were very close. Um, there's no she, way she would have just picked up and left. No, she would have never just disappeared on anybody like that. I mean, something had to have happened. Somebody did something to her. It was. It wasn't just willingly for her to disappear like that. As Tammy Niver's friends slogged through fields and forests, the rumors swirled, particularly around her ex-boyfriend. The old articles don't name him. Gregory Agnew, that is. When did the name Greg Agnew first come up for you? I, it was actually fairly early on, and I, I don't know that he was named, and he certainly wasn't named publicly by the police or by the press in those initial reporting days, but his name surfaced fairly early on in the sense that he was the last person to have known to see Tammy. She had gone to his apartment, an apartment that they had actually shared together, and she had recently moved out, so she had gone there late that night to pick up some clothes and some personal items, and um, Greg told the police that she left there about 2 a.m. So his name surfaced fairly early in that context. I don't think anybody was calling him a suspect in those first couple of days, but probably within the week or the second week, people were certainly very suspicious about Greg and his potential involvement in Tammy's disappearance. He was the father of one of Niver's two children, and despite being an off-and-on couple, friends said the pair didn't fight much more than the average couple. The day before Niver went missing, friend Stacy Burke stopped by. And nothing seemed unusual. I knew her, I knew the gentleman that she was with. I've known him for years as well. And so nothing seemed amiss? Nothing seemed strange at all. He was his normal self and she seemed like everything was fine. Couples bicker, couples fight. I mean, it's always gonna, somebody's always gonna have some kind of an issue one way or another with something. And, I mean, they weren't out of the ordinary when it came to that. 
but I don't ever remember anything being violent. I knew him as a happy person. And I didn't know him to be that type of person, but I said, the suspicions? Yeah, I, I can see it too. That's not who you knew to be a violent person, um, it sounds like, but... Growing up, no. But I could see where... He didn't want her to leave. I know that. I know he loved her. He didn't want her to leave. A co-worker of Nivers would later tell Sarah Scott about one fight the couple had in the days before her disappearance. The co-worker said, quote, He was very jealous. Tammy was talking to a friend on the phone, and he grabbed the phone out of her hands, said a few choice words, and slammed down the receiver. That's according to Sarah Scott's report in the Ypsilanti Press. Niver moved out of their shared apartment about that same time. Years later, family would say Niver, quote-unquote, feared for her life. I think, you know, most um, domestic violence experts will tell you that's a very volatile time um, in a relationship. So there there was that circumstance. You know, the, the police were initially suspicious uh, of Greg. I mean, I can remember when I went to, to knock on his door and, and he didn't answer, but um, you know, I, I had a police source call me later that day saying, you know, what were you doing over there? You know, and, you know, that's, that's a potential murder suspect that you were, you were trying to interview. When was the last time you heard about Tammy Niver? Well, I left to go to the Citizen Patriot in Jackson, and so it really wasn't that far away. And, um, you, you know, I would keep in touch with, with people I knew at the Ypsilanti Press and then and then again at the Ann Arbor News. Um, Paula Gardner, who was my boss, actually, um, I can remember her and I talking about this this story off and on throughout the years. And then the Ann Arbor News would do, like, the, the you know, the 10 years later story, the 20 years later. Um, but, yeah, that that's pretty much um, the, the last I ever reported about Tammy, Tammy Niver. Until... Until, yeah, until now. Hey there, this is uh, John Counts with Michigan Crime Stories. Uh, I'm sitting here with Sarah Scott and Darcy Moran, who reported this story. And this is kind of a unique uh, story in that all three of us have actually written some parts of this story, starting with uh, Sarah back in the 90s. I actually wrote about a lawsuit that was filed that you'll find out about in later episodes back in 2015, I believe. And then Darcy has been uh, following it recently for M Live. So, so first question, Darcy, um, as you've been reporting this, what, what sort of challenges have you encountered tackling a case that's so old? Well, there's been a lot of challenges, and it's not just the amount of time that's passed. Uh, I think that this is a very sensitive case, and you're going to hear more and more about that going forward into the next episodes. But this is something that police don't want to talk about and haven't wanted to talk about. And when it comes to finding witnesses then to fill in the gaps in this story, it becomes all the more hard when it is 25 years old. So we were lucky enough to find Paula Sarnofsky and Stacey Burke, um, who you hear in this episode, to, to tell us a little bit about Tammy. But, you know, it, it's definitely a hard thing to track down people that recall this still. So, Sarah, did you ever think that this case was going to resurface, that you'd be hearing this, this name Tammy Niver again? Honestly, I don't think I did. Um, you know, it was a, a huge story back in the early 90s, and it really took a toll on the Ypsilanti community, p- particularly because there was no resolution. And so it was it was sort of a surreal moment um, earlier this year when we were sitting in a staff meeting and Darcy started talking about this um, suspicious death that had just recently happened and that you know, coincidentally, this um, uh, woman's husband had a girlfriend that disappeared mysteriously back in the early 90s. And as she was talking, I kept getting this sort of weird sense of deja vu that I had heard this story before. And, you know, so I had asked Darcy, was, was her name Tammy Niver? So, Darcy, you talked a little bit about how police have been real tight-lipped 
in the in the present day was that kind of the case back in the 90s too when this when this first went down what was the relationship like with the police detectives back then it it was um it was definitely a little more loose um i think initially because it was a missing persons case you know we didn't know that there this was going to end badly and so the the police were pretty forthcoming um, with information initially and then as the the days went on um the weeks went on the months went on um they definitely became uh much more closed-lipped about what was going on did that become odd to you at all um in no, no, I, I think that's fairly common in a police investigation that if they, you know, if they think that they're, you know, speaking too much about a case could jeopardize the case, then then they den- generally do sort of, you know, close ranks and, and kind of shut down the pipeline of communication. And, and I ask that, and, and we'll probably talk about this more in the later episodes, is for me, when this story came up again this year, part of what spurred our, our work on this was the the amount of or, or lack thereof of commandary from police. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess the flip side of your question is that I was actually surprised by how tight lipped they are 25 years later. This is a 25 year old case. Um, normally, it, as we you know report on these old case and, it, cases, and as you guys know, we routinely do you know anniversary type stories on on old unsolved crimes. Usually, it's not hard to get a police detective to talk about a case and, and hope that by putting it back in the spotlight that we might you know shake loose some new information. So I was sort of very surprised by how reluctant they were to say anything at all. So one question that I think listeners might have is um, what kind of conclusions have either of you come to being so close to this case as why, what, what the motive behind this disappearance was? Well, John, I think our listeners are going to have to tune in for the other episodes to kind of get at what police and family and everyone thinks happened here. Um, I don't think you can get away from something Sarah touched on, which is domestic violence is something that definitely comes to um, the front of everyone's mind in a case like this and, and what we've been able to tell listeners thus far in this. And just to piggyback on what Darcy is saying, I think all of us know who have, you know, covered these types of stories, um, it, you know, with domestic violence situations, um, timing is critical. And when a relationship is, is breaking up or falling apart, I think most experts will tell you that's a very dangerous time. But that being said, uh, I think, again, people should tune in because there's a lot more to this story. Correct. Yeah, we're just starting to peel back the layers. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for listening. This has just been part one of a multi-part series, and uh, stay tuned for the rest of the episodes. Thanks to Paula Sarnofsky, Stacey Burke, and special guest Sarah Scott for speaking with us. And thanks to you for listening. If you have any questions about the story of Tammy Niver or Martha Agnew ahead of our next installment, Feel free to give me a shout at dmoran at mlive.com, and we may read and answer your question on the next episode. Again, that's d-m-o-r-a-n at mlive.com. I'm Darcy Moran, and this is Michigan Crime Stories. Coming up on Michigan Crime Stories. You know, just trying to pin it on it because the detectives involved in this case, he had sued them and made a recovery in federal court against them. All I know is when something stinks and I smell it, that's all I know. That's a case here. Stay tuned.